Ani, bojo. Joel Egawissa and Dijnikas. Uh, welcome to another special limited series edition of White Buffalo Circles at home edition. Uh, this time I'm actually in my classroom here at one of my schools filming this video. Um, history is a very interesting thing. For me growing up, I knew absolutely nothing about being an Ojibwe man. Um, all I knew growing up in a mainstream Canadian school was the ugly stereotypes that Canada throws at its indigenous people. I heard dirty, savage, uncivilized, uneducated, alcoholic criminals. That's what I grew up understanding about what it meant to be an Anishinaabe, to be an Indian. Um, and as a result, it made me very ashamed of who I was in this brown skin that I, that I have. Um, actually, by grade six, I actually started telling people that I was Spanish to avoid the ugly stereotypes um, that were being thrown at me on a daily basis here in this country. Uh, and self-esteem is a really big deal for young people. I don't think I have to tell you guys that when you look in the mirror every morning and all you see is those ugly stereotypes, that's the last thing that you want to be. So uh, yeah, I started telling people that I was Spanish. Um, that went on for, for a very long time, probably till grade nine or grade 10. And what that did for me was create this, I describe it now like kind of like a hole inside of me. Um, where there should have been pride and self-esteem and confidence, there was shame um, in an empty spot where my culture and pride should be. So at a very early age, I began kind of fill that spot with other things. I began drinking, I began doing drugs, um, you know, living an excessive lifestyle. Probably grade seven and grade eight, I started um, to live that way, again, to just mask those feelings that I was having of low self-worth and low self-esteem. Um, <clears throat> my father <clears throat> was an alcoholic from a very young age, and my grandfather as well. Um, so I grew up not knowing anything about traditional culture uh, in our family. Uh, and it was hard to argue those stereotypes because I did come from a long line of alcoholics and people were constantly saying how native people are all alcoholics and things like that. So it was extra tough for me to combat those stereotypes because it was true for, for me and my family. Um, when I was 15, I had left home and um, Later on that year, my father actually sobered up. He, he was 36 when he sobered up, and I had just turned uh, 16. And he knew that I was homeless and had reached out to me and asked if I wanted to come and live with him in the north. And my dad had sobered up at a traditional healing lodge in Wikwimakong uh, Rainbow Treatment and Healing Center. And that was the first time in many generations in my family that an uh, Egoissa man sat in a circle <clears throat> with elders and began to receive teachings. So when I moved up to the north with him, he had already begun his journey on the Red Road. And uh, at first he would ask me, hey Joel, you wanna come and join me with this elder and learn some teachings tonight? And I'd say, nah man, I'm, I'm good. You know, I'm gonna go hang with my friends and, and do what I was doing. Um, so it took a bunch of times of him asking me and, and inviting me to these circles and cultural events before I finally said, Sure, you know, I got nothing going on tonight, let's do it. So at 16 years old, for the first time in my life, I sat in a circle and uh, I began to learn about traditional native culture. Not the stereotypes Canada has been thrown at our people for hundreds of years, but before Europeans arrived here, how did we live? What did life look like? And it was really amazing because uh, every time somebody told me about traditional life of the Ojibwe people, it was beautiful. It was holistic. Um, it was about sharing and connectedness in the earth and the plants and the trees and just balance. You know, when we talk about circular thinking, balance is the word that always comes into play. So every time I sat, every time I learned, I learned something beautiful. And it was kind of surprising to me because, again, I'd grown up thinking all these awful things about who I was as a Anishinaabe man. So it didn't take long before Dad didn't have to ask. <laughs> I was... Uh, I was a little sponge, you know? I'm still a sponge. Uh, I love learning about my culture. Every time I sit and I learn these things, it helps to fill up that hole inside of me with those things that should have been there since I was a little boy. Um, but as time went on, 
um, something became very missing in the, in the big picture because I learned all these beautiful pre-contact things and if you've watched my videos up until now, I've taught you those things because all the videos I've done have been about pre-contact traditional life and culture. Um, and then as I got into college and I started to learn more and more and more, um, there was this big blank spot and this question that kept popping in my mind and was how did my people get from this beautiful, balanced and holistic culture way of being to the state that we're in today where Canada thinks all these awful things about us? And that connection, that piece that was missing uh, was history. <clears throat> in our textbooks here in Canada, you have to think about the source of who wrote them, right? These were European settlers, um, male settlers with European descent writing all of these textbooks. So Canada has learned all about the European experience here in Canada as a settler through the textbooks, right? That's what we all have learned in our schools because that's who wrote those books. Um, and nowhere in those textbooks did I ever see myself in the history of the Anishinaabe people. So it's been my mission and um, you know, my passion for many years to go into classrooms, to go into circles. I mean, that's what White Buffalo Circles is all about, is to share traditional culture, knowledge, and teachings and history with all these people that have never heard it before, that isn't written in those textbooks in our schools. So um, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a, a little walk through history, looking at it through an indigenous perspective, an indigenous lens. Um, and I'm going to warn you right now, it's, uh, it, can be, uh, it can be a sad story. It can be very heavy for many people to hear, especially people who have grown up thinking all these wonderful things about these great North American nations where we live today. Um, <clears throat> but when you talk about truth and reconciliation, it's been my opinion and the opinion of many of my elders that we cannot reconcile as a nation, as peoples, two different peoples, until everybody in this nation knows the truth. Once you guys hear this story, you can judge for yourself, you can gain your own perspectives, and then we can begin to reconcile. So um, I'm going to spend the next couple hours, I'm going to break it into several different series here. We're going to look back at the history of Turtle Island um, through an indigenous lens. And uh, that's what we're doing today. So let's get into it. Uh, so let's start with this. Turtle Island, 15,000 years, Turtle Island. A little over 150, Canada, America, and Mexico. Beautiful stories in our culture. Our people have an oral tradition, which means we didn't write things down, we handed it down like this never-ending link of chains from generation to generation to generation, our stories, our history, our culture, our way of being. Um, Turtle Island is one of those beautiful stories that I shared in, my, in one of my other videos <clears throat> with you guys. So, um, 15,000 years, we've known this place as Turtle Island. Uh, one of the common misconceptions, common things that I've heard people teach in schools is the, the land bridge theory where during the last ice age, we came across that ice from Northern Asia in here to North America and we populated it ever since. Um, recent archeological evidence has actually disproved that theory. Um, the last ice age ended about 12,000 years ago. It began about 14,000 years ago. And we have evidence in the Great Lakes Basin of First Nations presence dating back 15,000 years. So we know today that my people have been here in these lands um, for, since well before the last ice age. Now before Europeans arrived here, there were over 500 nations living here in Turtle Island. I am Ojibwe, that is one of the many nations of Turtle Island. Um, but again, before contact, 500 nations. If you could picture the map like, like you would um, the map of America where all the states are different colors and all cut up into these different territories, that's what Turtle Island looked like 500 years ago before the first European arrived on these lands, broken up into those many, many different nations. And what a lot of people don't realize <clears throat> is that First Nations people were well aware that Europeans would one day set foot on the shores of Turtle Island. 
We had many prophecies across the different nations of Turtle Island, and we had vast, intricate trading networks where we communicated and traded with each other from east to west, from north to south. Now, I mean, we were aware of each other's prophecies in many cases. And in the Ojibwe prophecy of the seven fires, um, it speaks in the fifth fire of the coming of the white race. We knew that one day, <laughs> on the east the shores of North America, our white brothers and sisters would arrive, and we would welcome them. That's one thing I always say in my circles, um, you're welcome here, and you've always been welcome here, because that's the type of people that we were. Um, if you were a guest in our house, you got the best bed, you got the best food, you got the best treatment, because that's how we treated our guests here in these lands, um, speaking of the Ojibwe in particular anyway. So uh, it was no surprise when those Europeans arrived on the shores of North America. <clears throat> the common date a lot of us talked about as far as uh, settlers first arriving here is this one here, 1492. Christopher Columbus sails the ocean blue. Um, actually about 300 years, 350 years before that, the, the Norse and the Vikings were trading with Inuit people in the northern parts of Turtle Island well before that. And then when the Crusades began in Europe, um, that was spanning about two or three hundred years, the Crusades. All of the uh, resources and energy went to those holy lands, and the trading stopped for, for many hundreds of years before the state that we now talk about as the original settlers coming across the ocean. Now, back then, um, it's about a two to three month journey across the ocean. You're coming way across the ocean from Europe, and you're landing here on the east coast of North America. So. Um, the European travelers would be um, leaving sometime in the spring, late spring, getting into the ocean. And if you, if you study things about history, it's very fascinating because uh, you may or may not know that Europeans at this time in the 1400s believed the Earth to be flat. Many of their scholars, astronomers, and scientists thought the Earth was this big checkerboard. And if you sail too far out into the ocean, you would fall off the edge of the planet. So Columbus, he was an Italian guy, but he's sailing for the Spanish king. Um, and rumor has it they were looking for a trade route to India. And they were pretty smart. I imagine Columbus studied the earth and studied the natural circles of the universe and had a great idea that if he went around the other side, he would bump in to where he wanted to go. Um, but you had to be pretty brave to sail up to the middle of the Atlantic all those many years ago. Problem is, um, a two or three month journey is really hazardous and a lot of the crew members would die from something called scurvy, um, which is a lack of vitamins in the body system, vitamin C in particular, that, that we need to survive. So after the first month of the journey, first few weeks, all the fruits and vegetables and things like that are dried up. Maybe the, um, the captain and the first officers are getting to eat the dried fruits and keep their stores up, but the rest of the crew are starting to die on the journey. So numbers that I heard, if 200 people got on a boat in Europe at that time, sailed across the ocean. By the time they got to the shores of North America three months later, half of that number would be dead. They'd be down to 100 people. So it'd be a real treacherous journey. I mean, people are dying, they're getting sick, you're having to throw bodies over and do ceremony all the time for those bodies. Um, and now they're getting to the shores of North America, and they're about to experience their first North American winter. And they haven't prepared any crops, they haven't built a proper shelter. So I like to kind of look back at um, that first contact, and I've heard many stories, but um, this is kind of how I think it would go in general. Right away when those boats arrived on the shores of North America, the First Nations tribes along the eastern seaboard, we didn't make contact right away. At first we seen the boats coming, um, we seen the light-skinned people coming off those boats. We recognized the prophecy was coming, that fifth fire was being lit. We began to spread the word, but we didn't make contact immediately. So those 100 people get off the boat, they begin to make shelters. You know, again, it gets cold, they don't have a lot of food. And through the first winter here in North America, that 100 people got cut in half again. Now we're down to 50 from the original 200 that left the shores of Europe. And these 50 survived that first winter. And we watched them suffer through that first winter as we spread the word of the arrival of the Europeans. Um, but in the spring, we introduced ourselves. We came out, we greeted our neighbors, our, our, our visitors from across the pond. 
Um, we showed them how to live here in these lands. We introduced to them the three sisters. Um, many of you might not have heard that term, the three sisters, but the three sisters refer refers to corn, beans, and squash. And if you plant those three plants together, um, they really help to support each other and the yield almost doubles. So the corn stalks grow really tall. They can grow you know, up to eight feet long. And then the beans kind of sprout around the corn stalks, allowing for maximum sun exposure, which allows them to grow even stronger and provide a better yield. And then you plant the squash, and pumpkin is, a, is obviously a type of squash, at the root of those two plants, and then the squash supports this, all three of those root systems together. And when you plant them in that way, the three sisters grow these incredible yields. So we taught them how to hunt for wild turkey. We introduced the three sisters. Um, we began a very kind and friend, friendly relationship. Now I mentioned 500 nations. Let's go over here. 500 nations. And that could be a small number, I bet there was more, but that's the number I've researched over my life. And the biggest number I've seen amongst those 500 nations is 100 million people. So across Turtle Island, from the bottom of Mexico to the top of what we now call Canada, 100 million indigenous people were living here prior to the first Europeans setting foot in these lands, spread across those 500 nations. And again, picture it all chopped up into different territories. So there was a lot of us. And if you want to think of terms of, in terms of power, which my people really did not have that way of thinking, we had all the power. There was 100 million of us and a few settlers coming off of those boats. But again, we treated our guests in a very good way. So it was very friendly in those beginning years. You know, we welcomed those brothers and sisters. We knew that they were coming. Um, we sat down after that first year and harvested our crops and we sat and we feasted. And every year we celebrate that initial relationship, that initial friendship, what we now call Thanksgiving. Um, often I find in schools that we've kind of forgotten the root of that holiday, but that's what we're talking about is that, that first friendly contact where the Europeans and the First Nations people sat down and feasted in the fall. So more and more boats are coming across the ocean. Again, a friendly relationship at the beginning. Um, we talk about treaties um, a lot in the work that I do in education. And one thing that we have to talk about when we, before you even mention treaties is, is wampum. Um, again, my people had an oral tradition. So it wasn't the traditional treaty that was written in English and signed by lawyers. Um, in our treaties, we sat down, we discussed the arrangement, how we were going to treat each other, how we were going to treat these lands and live together. And then we wove it out in this beautiful belt that we call a wampum belt. Um, now, wampum generally was purple and white. Um, the purple beads from wampum come from something called quahog. Um, where you can get these beautiful little purple beads that are all kind of hand manufactured, hand carved, and then you weave it out into the agreement that is um, the treaty, you know, per se. So the original treaty between the first European settlers and the First Nations people of these lands who, who met here on the eastern seaboard, and as I go through this lesson, you really have to think about that, because the first settlers came to the east. It took a very long time for them to come around and start to populate the west coast. And it was even longer before the tracks connected east to west across North America. So the very first agreement that we had with the European settlers was this. This is what we call the two-row wampum. Now basically, it's two purple lines down the middle of a white wampum belt. Now, if a wampum was created during war times, and it was uh, a treaty about how we were going to live together post-war, then the background of the wampum would be purple, and the depiction would be white. In this case, this wampum was created in a time of peace, where we just were making an agreement about how we were going to live together with these new visitors from across the ocean. And it's quite simple. Each of the purple rows represents a river. And each of these rivers flows 
into the future. It's kind of an endless um, depiction. Uh, the agreement was this. The First Nations and our people, we would row down the river in our canoe. And the European settlers, they would row down the river in their boats beside us. And side by side, as brothers and sisters, we would travel down this river into the future together. We would not steer your boat. We would not attempt to steer your boat. And you would not attempt to steer our boat. We were both in charge of our own boats and our own destinies as we traveled together into the future. We would share the resources of these lands together and equally as we traveled beside each other into the future down this river. It's a beautiful concept. Um, and I really wish one day we could get back to that concept. <clears throat> but of course, again, with being 100 million of us and only a few settlers, um, it was absolutely agreed upon. That sounds great to those guests coming from across the ocean. Um, let's do that, right? But as time went on, um, this relationship was forgotten as the power structures shifted. So um, we'll take a break there and then we'll come back and we'll kind of get into the, the 1700s um, for the next, next lesson. So bum up here for now, my friends, and uh, we'll talk again soon.